Hello and welcome back to this Redshift tutorial part 2. I'm very excited to continue this series. Before we start off, we're going to get straight into it. I've updated Redshift to 3.0.49. This new update includes Asus. We're not going to go into Asus if you don't know what it is. My recommendation is you go off and you research what Asus is. It's a color profile. It's going to try and standardize color. I'm going to get too much more into it other than that. I will be doing more videos on color correction and grading in the future. It has slightly changed our scene right now without doing too much tweaking. I just wanted to continue from where we were. The scene is a little darker, but the colors are richer and more saturated. That is to do with the Asus color profile. Right now, we're just kind of focusing on the sky, dome light, HDR. Might get to a little trace depth. Before we go into the HDR today, we are going to look at how to cut down the render time from our last scene. Let's see where we are currently. Let's just render this out. So our light is at 256 our ambient occlusion 256 and our reflection at 256 global illumination at 1024 so let's see where this goes that is at about 45 seconds so you know that's okay it's not too high we want to fix this up brighten the scene but have a fast render time how do we do this we are going to use a little bit of trickery stick an area light in our scene select our area light press r for rotation scale our area light right down maybe bring it to 100 by 100 bring that up and maybe bring our area light to where the window is here. It's super bright. We don't really want that. Bring that bright multiplier down to about five. Turn shadows off for that area light. Okay, so we can already see from the Iradian's cache that our scene is much brighter, maybe a little bit saturated. And we're not gonna make this perfect, we're just kind of showing how this works. So we have an extra light in our scene, global illumination on. This means our light is giving off more light in the scene, and we're trying to you know, direct it from this area. That is taking longer, and that's expected. But we have a brighter scene now. Bring our samples down for our GI, and go into our subsamples for our light. Bring that up to 512. Maybe even bring, mm, let's see about that for now render again now that is rendering much faster and we're getting a bit of noise in the back 38 seconds the reason i'm showing this technique because if you can't run really heavy global illumination you could just bring an extra light in and run a denoiser on this could still look good i'm just kind of looking for cheap ways to get a better look so another thing we can do is go into our sky select our sun and scale our sun disk scale right up but let's put this up to 70. What this is basically going to do is it's going to spread out our sunlight and diffuse it nicely. On our last render, we had this really kind of harsh light. This will give more realism to the scene. I love this style of lighting, personally. It feels more real, there's a bit more moodiness to it, and 34 seconds, so, and we're getting a little less grain. So let's look at this, and we have a little less grain, and that's because that light is carrying some weight in this scene. Let's turn off the specular for this light. And let's go back into our render settings. Bring this up to 124. We might get away with a similar render time here. We're getting more grain, but we're 37 seconds. So we've really cut down there. We're between 45 and 50 seconds. We've shaved off a good amount. And with enough tweaking, we could shave off more. And we've given our light more sample. Let's take a screenshot of this and go through them. I liked that I turned off the specular. These highlights really aren't needed. We're getting enough highlights with our skylight anyway. Something that really helped is understanding how this sky worked, scaling up that sun disk, because it's, you're just getting a softer fall off here. If we were to, let's do one more thing and we'll go into our HDR. We're going to put a denoiser on and it's very soft and you know, you can sharpen it up and post, but we are getting rid of a lot of the grain. There's a little bit of banding there though. This is veered towards if you can't put all the samples and lights in the scene, you don't have the machine for this. Cheat the GI a little, cheat the sky a little, stick a light in there. This is passable. It's a really good compromise and I would experiment with more than just one light. You could even use a point light to see how that gets on. I just want to show you how to optimize our light last scene. I don't want people to think that you just use a skylight and that's it. You definitely can optimize it, add your own flair and style to it as you please. We are going to turn off our sky and sun and we're going to turn off our area light. We are going to stick on our dome and there should be a HDR. Let's render it 
our HDR, see what time we are, see how much noise we're getting, which we're not getting an awful lot here with the HDR. Okay, that's rendering at 34 seconds. Our HDR is rendering a little faster here, but we're not getting a lot of light in our scene. So the thing with the HDR is you are relying very heavily on the image itself and the brightness of that image. You can bump up the exposure here, but all you're really doing is adding exposure to the HDR. You're not adding more intensity really or anything like that because it's getting its information from the HDR. So this looks okay, but it, you are going to be blowing out the HDR to get that light information. You've just got to realize that maybe your colors aren't as accurate when you're blowing out the HDR and adding so much exposure, but you are going to get more brightness. That is rendering at 37 seconds and we're not getting as much noise with our GI, which is nice. The nice thing about the HDRs is you get maybe a nicer fall off and a more realistic solution. Just because it's faster here does not mean it's going to be faster all the time. It's very contextual to your scene and situation, which is something I found over and over again with Redshift. Let's see what we would get if we put this to 10 bounces and took down the exposure of our HDR to one. And let's maybe turn on our area light and use the same trickery that we did. Go 512 on our samples for our light because we had that at 1024 for the sky. And actually, let's do a bucket render. That is 32 seconds. And it's going to be a little bit brighter in the scene. You can brighten it up in post as well. Remember that. Are we getting less or more noise here? I would say we are getting more noise in our last scene. So let's bring this back up to 1024. And let's bring our bounces back down to eight. I don't think we really need to go beyond that. And let's bring our raise up to one, two, four. And let's see if we can stay within this range around 40 seconds. If you're getting your render time down, it might be worth experimenting with two brute forces because you're going to get a better render through that, like a less noisier render, the light bounce in the room. We're definitely getting a little bit less noise here. Staying under that kind of 40 second mark, we're going to bring this back down to two and we're going to use our area light this time. We're not upping our render time here, which again is nice. Still really, really fast. That's around 37 again. Let's take a snapshot of that and let's go through our scenes and you know using that extra light is worth doing we could even bring the intensity of this area light down to two and could we enable shadow see what that does for us and I think that shadow back in has given us some nice occlusion in the eye sockets. And that's 39 seconds. So you know, we're approaching that 40 second mark again. You can see all the different looks you can get and definitely experiment with switching the shadows off, switching the shadows on. If you're going to put another light into your scene, does the specular work here? It's all about experimenting for the context of your scene with Redshift. So one of the next things I want to go through is trace depth. So trace depth is a really tricky one. I overlooked it for a while. The more I looked into it and the more I experimented, the more I realized it can really up your render times if you don't know how to use it. And if you know where to use it, it can actually make your renders look better. So what it does is it controls how deep the ray for reflection and the ray for refraction can go. This would be, you know, a lower reflection and refraction trace depth, and this would be a higher one. What that means is it can calculate the ray of reflection and refraction through each piece of glass material here. It doesn't just apply to glass. Like one doesn't kind of make one better than the other or more realistic necessarily. Again, very contextual. That's why they're giving you the control. If we wanted a render engine that was very photo real focused, they probably wouldn't give you this control because it would need to be calculated correctly in a physically accurate way. For a stylized look, you might want very little trace depth. Or if you're in a stylized scene where you're having a unique look, you might want to really up those refractions and reflection. You can see that these rays are they're calculating off each other. Let's put reflection to eight here bring our refraction down to two bring our combined up to 10. I'll explain the combined bit in a minute. That was 43 seconds. There is a bit of a difference. Now it is so subtle in this case. So because we've upped the amount of rays for our reflection, we're getting less anomaly with our reflection. Now quite a blown out highlight here within this rim. It's actually sorting out how deep the reflection go, how accurate the reflection in the scene is. And that's what's happening here. 
Let's put a frosted glass into our scene. Let's delete this. Let's bring this back down to 4466. Four, six. Okay, as this renders, I'm going to explain the combined panel. Let's put this to six. Richard will basically look at the scene. The combined value is like a threshold. Your rays will fire into the scene. As your ray fires off, it's reflected four times. That means it can only be refracted two more times. So that it's only allowed two more rays of refraction at that point if you set the combined to six. So that means you have four ref reflections and only two rays left for refraction. So that's an interesting thing. If you set this to 12, both can go to six. This can really up your render time. We're already up to 50 here, but we're going to start comparing the render here. Okay, so we have this glass material. We're gonna get reflection and refraction. This scene is rendering at 50 seconds. Let's take a screenshot of this. And we're going to up our refraction to 10, put this to 12, put our reflection to eight. Let's see what happens in this scene now. So we have a snapshot. We're gonna see if there's any differences in how the light bounces, how the rays refract and reflect in our scene. And this should up our render time by a substantial amount here. Okay, that is rendering at one minute and eight seconds. But let's take a snapshot of this and have a look. So we have a bit of noise here let's really try and spot the difference here it's like where's Wally okay we could definitely see a difference in the front part of the skull that's the most obvious thing we have a lot of refraction allowed you can see it you know there's more light bouncing around inside the skull there's a nice brightness to it maybe it's too bright maybe we've allowed too much to go on but where this trace depth you'll really see the difference and it will add sometimes it will add some more noise but Look at the side of the red skull. That's where the real example of trace depth comes in. You have reflection and refraction, and it's allowing the rays that bounce off this refractive and reflective material to hit this red material here. Let's see if we get the same result on the red skull. Not so much, a little bit, but it's not hitting the source you want. You're gonna get a little bit more noise and you can see our noise will increase. So the unfortunate thing about this is, yes, it will add some interesting and nice and more realistic results, but you're gonna really start to up your render times. Now we have this quite high. Let's bring this up to 14 and let's bring our reflection up to 10 and bring our refraction back down to eight. Maybe bring this up to 14. Let's just pause this render for now. Go into our render settings we actually have refraction in our scene and we need to add some samples to that. So we've quite a bit of refraction now in our scene and quite a bit of reflection. And this is looking like a chunky render time. That was one minute, 10 seconds. So this is the fun part where you get to really see how this works. So first off, we can see our refraction and reflection is much less noisy. That's the beauty of upping our samples. And this highlight, I'm sure if we bumped the trace depth up, this highlight would be corrected. These are the, the finer details. Much less noise there. The refraction less blown out because we, you know, we didn't apply as many rays. Uh, trace depth can really make a difference with caustics, which we will go into in this series. I just kind of want to touch on it for now. I really hope you got something from this. This is a little bit more complicated. Remember to like and subscribe and all that good stuff. There won't be a part three next week, but there will be a part three. We're going to be veering towards more bespoke things. I'd like to look at volumes. We'll also maybe start to look at the post effects and where and how to use them and how to use them correctly and manage your color. Remember to like, subscribe. Thank you for watching and goodbye.